Now, whether it's a V10 Viper or a Ford Fusion Ecotech, today on Tech Garage, it's all about the engines. Did I say V10? Welcome to Tech Garage presented by Advanced Auto Parts. Today it's all about the engine. We're going to look at the lower end and we're going to look at the upper end. And of course, we're going to give you some diagnostic tips and some diagnostic scenarios that you can perform on your engine to check the mechanical integrity. And a little later, we're going to look at emerging technologies. You know, it all started in 1862 with Nicholas Otto as he invented the four-stroke cycle engine. And to look at it, I have a cutaway here. So come on down here with me and you'll be able to look inside this cutaway as we go through the four-stroke cycle. Now the first stroke is the intake stroke. And what happens here is the piston's on its way down. And as the piston goes down, you can see the intake valve opens. That's letting that air fuel mixture enter into the cylinder. Now the next stroke, the piston starts on its way up. As the piston comes up, it's compressing the fuel and that's called the compression stroke. Comes all the way up to the top and then what happens? The spark plug fires, that's the power stroke. It explodes the fuel and the combustion pushes down on the piston and that's the force we need to run our engine. Then the last stroke as we come up, the exhaust valves open and you're pushing out that spent gases or that exhaust as it comes out that valve. Now, two things important about the strokes. A little later, we're going to talk about cylinder leakage test. And on a cylinder leakage test, we want the cylinder at top dead center compression stroke. And to do that, we're going to go through the intake, and we're coming up here to the top dead center of the compression stroke. Why? Both valves are closed. We're going to inject some air into the cylinder. And when we inject air into the cylinder later, we're going to listen for it to come out the intake valve, the exhaust valve, perhaps it's coming out the oil fill cap, but we know that it's not supposed to come out anywhere because the valves are closed and the rings are sealing. One other thing, between these two strokes right here is where the timing is. If we're at top dead center on the compression stroke, that's zero timing. If we advance the timing, we're moving back a little bit, a little bit into the compression stroke, and then if we retard the timing, we're going a little bit into the power stroke. So it's a good idea to have the basics down on this four stroke cycle, but what we need to do next is take a look at some of the engines and lower end configuration. Now engines come in all shapes and sizes and configurations. You know our Viper had a V10, there's a V6 right there behind me, and this is a V8. This is a 350 typical V8 block, and I want to show you some of the components so later when we get into the diagnostics, you understand why some of the tests are taking place. On the lower end, we have a crankshaft right here. Now the crankshaft goes clean through the block, and attached to the crankshaft are called connecting rods. The connecting rods run down and run the piston up in the block. Now also the crankshaft's bolt down with these main bearings. You heard of four bolt mains, two bolt mains. Well, these are the main bearings that are holding the crankshaft in. Now this crankshaft turns those pistons up and down that we saw earlier during the four stroke cycle. And we can take one of these bearings apart because I want to knock one of these pistons out so I can show you the rings and the configuration of the rings. So later when we make our test, you'll be able to understand what's the importance of the compression test and what's going on if our results are not that good. Now when I pull this bearing off, you can see there's a bearing in here. Now the thin film of oil rides on here, and this is an actual rod bearing here, and I have a thrust bearing. This thrust bearing goes somewhere in there to keep the crankshaft from moving back and forth. I also have a bearing here that's pretty well shot. This one here didn't get any oil. You can see it probably spun in the block. That resulted in engine noise, engine knock, low oil pressure but our diagnosis will tell us what's going on with that a little bit later. Now let me see if I can knock this piston out of here. There we go. Great, now this way, you can see the rings. These are the piston rings. And what's going on with the piston rings, when that piston went up and down, it's keeping the compression inside of the cylinders during that power stroke and the compression stroke when it explodes. We can't let any of that blow by go by these rings. This one right here is an oil control ring. That's gonna keep the oil from going up in there and possibly causing your engine to smoke. Later, we're gonna do a compression test. And when we do a compression test, we're actually gonna run the piston up and down and look how much pressure it's making. These rings 
things are responsible for that. You'll see later, perhaps we have low compression. We're gonna put a little oil in the cylinder, and what that oil is gonna do is it's gonna seal the gap between the rings and the block. So if the compression comes up, we know we have a ring problem. If the compression doesn't come up, we're gonna have to run a few more tests. Well, that's a good look at the lower end, but there's also the oiling system. This is the oil pump. Now the oil pump runs the oil through here, and it's gonna come up through a series of galleries all around this block. And what happens is it comes through and it oils the connecting rod bearings, and and it's going to oil the main bearings and we're going to do an oil pressure test and that's going to tell us if we have pressure to get that job done. Now we need to go to Brian for the email question and we'll do that when we come back with more Tech Garage presented by Advanced Auto Parts. What stroke occurs immediately after the spark plug is fired? A. Intake stroke, B. Compression stroke, C. Power stroke or D. Exhaust stroke. The correct answer is C. The spark plug is fired during the end of the compression stroke and the beginning of the power stroke. This edition of Tech Garage, presented by Advance Auto Parts, is being brought to you by Spartan Powertrain, proven quality and reliability for engine cylinder heads and rear axle assemblies. ARP, the world leader in fastener technology. Steel rubber, quality crafted rubber parts and weather stripping. And by Advance Auto Parts. Let's get you back to the garage. And now the email question of the week, presented by Advance Auto Parts. John, we've got an email question here from one of our viewers, Jordan, in Billings, Montana. Jordan's got a 92 Chevy pickup. He says it's been a great vehicle and the engine's never smoked. But now at first start up in the morning, he's starting to see some smoke. Jordan says maybe the truck's just worn out. It does have 200,000 miles showing on the odometer. What's your advice to help Jordan make this truck last even longer? Brian, you know this happens to a lot of people, not just Jordan, it's a common problem. You go out there and you start your car or truck in the morning and you get that white puff of smoke, sounds like valve seals. But the good news is, it's not catastrophic damage. We can go ahead and just show you an old racer's trick that we can go ahead and pull the valve seal right out of there without even removing the head. Now I have a cylinder leakage gauge here. What I did is I screwed it in and I'm gonna inject air into the cylinder. Now what the air's doing is it's pushing up on those valves. And I take my rocker arm off here. And when I take my rocker arm, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put the nut back on. So I can take my valve spring compressor here, go on top of the valve, and now what I'm doing is I'm gonna compress it down. And when I compress it down, I'm removing these keepers right here. Now these keepers is what holds the valve spring to the valve. And this is a good look at the head because here's the valve spring, the top rotator, and the keepers. The valve's located right here. Now the air is keeping the valve up. Now the problem with Jordan's having is probably this valve seal right here. So all you have to do is go down and get a new set of valve seals. I'm gonna pop that one off right here. Once I get that off, that sheds the oil. This is a positive lock seal. It goes down on here. You can have umbrella seals that move up and down with the valve. Just go get your new valve seal. Come over here, slip it back on. <clears throat> then I got a little 13 millimeter. I'm gonna lock it down on there. And once I lock it down on there, another piece of the puzzle is an O-ring. This O-ring I wanna replace too. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and put my spring back on. And when I put my spring back on, we'll go ahead and compress it down. And at the same time we're compressing it down, we're gonna do two things. We're gonna go ahead and replace this and the keepers. Once you do that, everything's in good shape. Your car should stop smoking, Jordan, but more importantly, you saved a lot of money. If you have a question for Tech Garage, email it to techgarage at advanced-auto.com and be sure to watch to see if your question makes it on the show. Well, we looked at the basics of the engine block and the cylinder head, but the good news is you can go down and get a complete cylinder head, all remanufactured and ready to go. All you have to do is bolt it on. And we have with us today, Mark Johnson from LKQ. Mark, this looks like a pretty cool head. You just take it and bolt it on, it's cost effective. What's so great about it? Well, the best thing is you go to your advanced store and you pick the thing up and it is ready to go. It's truly ready to bolt on. What makes it that way? Well, these are quality cores. 
We go through a complete machining process of first identifying the core, cleaning the core, making sure it's a good core to work with. We cut the valve job. These are cut seats, they're not ground seats. We surface them. All of the valve seats and valves are vacuum checked. We don't lap them in, we vacuum check them. Nothing thinner than air, right? That's right. You can't hold a vacuum, it, it leaks. So everything is precision uh, machined and everything is, is checked for proper uh, sealing. And you're not only just getting that, I see you have a camshaft there. You're also getting a camshaft with the complete cylinder head. You told me a little bit earlier, what's the cool thing about that camshaft, the manufacturing process? Well, this happens to be a single overhead cam uh, Ford motor, 4.6 liter. These are the cam profiles. They form these out of powdered metal and they're rough formed. This camshaft, when it starts out, is nothing more than a, a high quality steel tube that is rough machined and it's machined with these little grooves, these little ribs here. And these lobes have serrations in them. So each one of these lobes is positioned in the correct position and, and clocked for, um, lobe for the lobe. And these are put on there. And a ball is forced down through the center of this tube and that tube is expanded into these serrations of this cam loop to hold it in place. Wow, that's so it's a pretty cool manufacturing process. Mark, I know you're in charge of the high performance. Now our viewers, they're all into high performance. What can they do to gain a bunch of horsepower with a cylinder head? Well, the easiest thing to do, especially in this particular application, being a single overhead cam motor, there's a lot of aftermarket cam grinding companies that offer quite a range of, of cam grinds. Easiest thing to do is a camshaft swap, and most people are, are capable of doing something like that. Yeah. So the one thing that I would recommend is don't get too crazy. Have some realistic goals, and know that if you make more power, you're gonna be breaking stuff. Awesome, thank you for coming. Listen, we're gonna get the Viper out of here. We're gonna pull in a charger, because you need to know all the diagnostics that's gonna determine the mechanical integrity of our engine. And we'll do that next, as soon as we return with more Tech Garage presented by Advance Auto Parts. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by Advanced Auto Parts. Now the fun stuff. We're gonna dive into the engine and we're gonna run some tests. Now the first test we're gonna run is a compression test. A compression test is simple. You can get a compression gauge and go out and run it yourself, but we'll run them together. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure your engine's warm, up to operating temperature, and then remove all the spark plugs from your engine. Once you do that, another thing you need to do is block the throttle wide open. Why? Because I wanna make sure all the air is getting into the cylinder so when we get compression on the gauge, we know we have no restrictions. Then we want to disable the ignition somewhere so we can crank the engine over. You remember those four stroke cycle? We want four puffs. We want to go through at least four strokes so we can see that. Now I'll go down here and pull my coil off here. And once you get the coil off, you can go ahead and remove the spark plug. Get the spark plug out of there. And what we're gonna put in there is a compression gauge. So I'm gonna take this hose, it goes down in, takes the place of the spark plug, and then I'm gonna connect it. And what we're gonna do is turn the car over for four puffs. And what we wanna do is we wanna watch the gauge. We want at least half the compression on the first puff, and then it takes about 90 PSI for a car to run, but check your specifications. We'll go ahead and take a look at this one when we turn it over for four puffs. Great, we're all the way up to 175. That's good, this cylinder's in good shape. What you would do is simply just go around to all the cylinders. If there was a big difference, you had a problem in that cylinder. Now, if there wasn't a lot of compression, we can just take this oil can, it's called a wet compression test, squirt a little oil in there, rerun the test. Remember earlier, we seal them rings. If we seal those rings up, we know that the leak's on the upper end and not on the lower end. But if we wanna diagnose it that, we can take it one step further. I have a cylinder leakage gauge, and what the cylinder leakage gauge is gonna do, it's gonna inject air into that cylinder. 
And when we inject air into that cylinder, what we're doing is we got it on top dead center on the compression stroke. The valves are closed, the engine's filling up with air. Now we're listening for the air. We wanna listen for it to come out of the throttle body. That would mean an intake valve's leaking. We can listen to it coming out of the tailpipe. Well, that's an exhaust valve leaking. Perhaps it's coming out the oil fill or the oil dipstick. That means the rings are bleeding by, or if you have bubbles in your radiator, that's a blown head gasket. Now those tests are great, but I got a couple more to show you. Here are the prices on some of the items John mentioned that can be purchased at Advance Auto Parts or other stores. We got two more tests to look at, and these tests will give you all kinds of information about your engine. I want to look at oil pressure and vacuum test. Now, the first one we're going to look at is oil pressure. Now, our oil pressure test is going to tell us if we have oil pressure in the engine. Remember those bearings and how important that oil was? Our specs right here on our MotoLogic is actually showing idle at 5 psi. I don't like 5 psi, but it's okay in this case. And then 3,000 RPM, 45 to 100 pounds per square inch of pressure. That'll tell us if we have good oil pressure. I went and removed the oil pressure sending unit. And when I took that out, I put the gauge in. You wanna do that because this is electrical. So it's sending an electrical signal to the dash and it could be a false reading. The manual oil pressure is the way to go. Also on the vacuum gauge, I hooked it up to an intake source. The vacuum gauge is gonna tell us what's going on. It should be anywhere from about 16 to maybe 26 inches of mercury. That's an absence of pressure. Compression on the compression stroke, vacuum on that intake stroke. A couple of scenarios you may run into to, vacuum's fluctuating. Well, that's usually a valve issue. Or the vacuum can be low, but even. That's usually an intake leak. You may have vacuum that's actually dropping at 3,000 RPM down to zero. Well, that means you have an exhaust restriction because the vacuum's backing up, we can't get anything into the cylinders. So we'll crank it up and take a look at these. Well, you can see our oil pressure is about 80, 82. Our vacuums dropping a little bit to about 16. This one's in good shape. Both of them are steady and both have good pressure. You can run these tests on any vehicle, old or new, it doesn't make any difference. And speaking of new, we have some new technologies to show you and we'll do that right after the break. Which gauge vacuum reading would be a good indication of an intake vacuum leak? A, the vacuum drops slow when the engine is held at 2,000 RPMs. B, fluctuating low vacuum readings, C, excessively high vacuum readings, or D, high rapidly fluctuating vacuum. The correct answer is B, a gauge reading with the needle fluctuating three to nine inches mercury below normal often indicates a vacuum leak in the intake manifold. This edition of Tech Garage presented by Advance Auto Parts is being brought to you by Spartan Powertrain, proven quality and reliability for engines, cylinder heads, and rear axle assemblies. Custom Auto Sound, the originator of classic car OEM fit radios since 1977. Low Car, quality plain and simple. And by Advance Auto Parts, let's get you back to the garage. Welcome back to Tech Garage. I got some really cool technologies to show you, and I want to start right here with the engine. You know, engines are becoming lighter, faster, more horsepower, and they're good on emissions. How are they achieving that? Well, there's several technologies right here that I want to show you. The first one's right here on the front. This is called variable valve timing. Well, years ago we could take our distributor, we could move it back and forth or electronically move it back and forth, but now we take it one step further. Oil pressure gets actuated into this cam phaser right here and this cam phaser actually moves the camshaft to the left or to the right. What's that doing? Effect in timing. We get optimal performance at all ranges. Now another one is direct injection. Direct injection here, this is a direct injector pump. And what's happening is the fuel pressure is coming from the tank at about 40 to 60 PSI. And then this cam lobe right here is driving this direct injector pump. And that direct injector pump then's boosting the pressure up to about 1,000 to 3,000 PSI. It goes through the lines and it goes directly into the cylinder. Diesel's been doing it for years, but we're doing it with gasoline. Better atomization, better performance, better fuel economy. Another one, variable valve electronic lift. This is wild. If I take this off here, you can actually see where we can vary the camshaft lift. 
you can see that this is a linear motor and it runs up and down on this cam and it varies the lift. Well, remember we used to buy them camshafts for torque ranges from 1,000 to 3,000 or we had to buy the torque range from anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 RPM. Well, this one here varies it, just like the human. That's what an engine does. It breathes lightly at an idle. And if you're getting on it, it's gonna want a lot more air. The valve lift is gonna let it do that. And those are some cool technologies. Another one right here is a continuous variable transmission, CVT. Remember our go-karts, golf carts? You just go and it goes continuously and the range is almost infinite. No shift in gears, that's what's happening here. These are variators and what the variator does, this chain goes through here and when the car's running, it's just constant velocity. It's not switching gears. Why? You're in that optimal torque range, you get better performance at all times. You know, they're making them with six speeds, eight speeds, nine speeds now to achieve the same thing. But important tip, if you're dealing with these CVTs, use the right fluid. I've seen a lot of these wiped out just because the wrong fluid was used. Check your manufacturer specifications. Another technology has been around for years is called turbocharging. The cool thing about this though, it's a variable geometry or a varied geometry turbocharger, VGT. What does that mean? Well, it's just like any other turbocharger. I'm spinning here with the exhaust on the turbine, the compressor compressing it, forced induction. We're adding that fuel, we're adding that air into the cylinder, we're cramming it in. If you don't drive a turbocharger hard, you're getting better gas mileage, you're getting better efficiency. The cool part are these veins right here. So I move these veins up and down, and as I move these veins up and down, you can see I can vary the flow, avoiding that turbo lag. And you know, our Ford Fusion right here has an EcoBoost with a turbocharger on it. Whether it's a new Ford Fusion with all this new technology, or it's an old school 350. You're ready to tackle any problem, so get out there and get started. We're out of time for today. So, from our garage to your garage, thanks for watching Tech Garage, presented by Advance Auto Parts.